Professor Suri and uh, Resonance, Professor Mukunda and others to uh, invite me today to share with you some interesting chemistry experiments. Uh, before I begin, I would like to again uh, welcome uh, Shruti and Ananya. Uh, because they have done all the background work to set up the experiments. I should also thank uh, Merck Sigma Aldrich because they supply some of the more expensive chemicals that I'm going to blow up today. Not really blow up, use up. Uh, there will be no fire or, uh, you know, flame or explosions here. There will be some on the screen. Okay? All right. <clears throat> so, uh, this is the first one, in fact. Uh, sometimes I, I do the real experiment. Um, and these are hydrogen balloons. Can we have the lights dim because my uh, screens are generally dark? Okay. So uh, let's see. Uh, let's celebrate the 2020. So this is uh, explosion of hydrogen balloons, uh, which we routinely do in our group. Uh, I would like to point out to you, since it is the celebration of resonance in 25. Uh, I was associated with the early years of resonance uh, uh, when Professor Mukunda was the chief editor. And one of the things, uh, a student of mine, uh, his name is interesting, Photon Rao. Uh, what Photon did was to publish an article in resonance uh, which illustrates how a uh, Zwitter ionic dye can show very large solvatochromic effect. In other words, no, chroma is color, right? So solvatochromism is basically change of color with change in solvent polarity. And this particular dye made by Rikard, and it's commonly called Rikard's dye, shows, in fact, subtle changes in color between, well, not so subtle, between methyl and ethyl alcohol, and isopropyl alcohol, acetone, and isone. So you can see that, you know, even a single difference of a CH2 group can make such a large difference in, in the color. And as you know that many uh, people die every year uh, taking what they believe is the two carbon alcohol, but instead it is contaminated with the one carbon alcohol. And this is a very quick way to distinguish whether a big container has a methanol or ethanol. And since methanol is likely to become a, a fuel of the future, well, one of the fuels of the future which is relatively safe, so it may be an easy way to distinguish the two. So as I said, this is Reichardt's dye, and uh, Professor Reichardt was still alive, and Photon sent a copy of resonance to him. And uh, this morning I find out, found out from my old collection of files that Professor Reichardt, in fact, sent a nice letter to, uh, to Photon, and I will read it out here. He says that, um, you know, I would like to thank you for this excellent short review on the Betain dyes which I had synthesized some years ago. By the way, I should mention, I have never used the term Reichardt's dye for this. Others called it Reichardt's dye. So it was a very nice signed letter that was sent uh, from uh, Marburg um, to, to Photon when he was a student in my group. All right. One of the things I would like to point out to you is it's very important in, in, in science in general, and of course all branches of science, including chemistry, that you ask questions. Unfortunately, our education system always encourages students to only answer questions. And I often jokingly tell younger people, the high school students, that all these training schools where you go to for IIT, etc., etc., will only train you to find three wrong answers. And sometimes never to ask the, find out the real answer. So it's very important to ask questions. And let me uh, point that out with, a, with an example. Uh, you may recall that you know when you were seven, eight, nine years old and you returned from school, uh, whoever is at home, maybe your mom if she is not working or your grandparents, normally they would ask you, what would they ask you? What did you learn? How was your school? So this guy says, this gentleman says, not my mom. My mom would say, did you ask a good question today? And then he goes on to say that that difference. Asking good questions made him become a scientist. And who is he? His name is I. I. Rabi, a physicist who got the Nobel Prize in 1944 for his resonance method for recording the magnetic properties of atomic nuclei. This, this is from his Nobel lecture. 
Uh, do you know which technique it is? Yes, so I have highlighted uh, in the reverse order nuclear magnetic resonance. And as you know, that is a very powerful tool, although discovered by physicists, chemists took over, and now biologists are also sharing the benefits of nuclear magnetic resonance and, of course, MRI imaging by, by the medical doctors. So, to encourage uh, you ask questions, I will ask a couple of questions to you. One of them is, no, this is not the question. This is only warming up. Okay. Uh, so, there is no pride in guessing the answer of this because you have all read in your history book some in, 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 in school, right? Uh, I'll show you something that looks like this. Can you guess? And obviously, this is related to some chemistry you have been studying from high school days, maybe class 11 or uh, first PU or second PU, maybe. And this has played a very important role in our daily lives and still plays. Okay. So that's the first question and anybody who gives the correct answer will get a copy of this book. All right. So I will ask one of the volunteers to identify whoever answers it. And I'll give you a hint as we go along. Okay. So uh, whoever wants to answer, hopefully with the correct answer, please raise your hand. Every image that we show, you know, if I show an electron microscopic image, uh, you have seen some of these electron microscopic images of, of the head of an ant or the hair. One of the key things there is to give a scale so that you know how big it is or how small. So if I don't give a scale here, you have no idea how big this thing is, right? So my scale here is uh, Professor Sujit Roy of uh, IIT Bhuvaneshwar. He's about five and a half feet. So using that, him as a scale bar, you can guess the length of this tower. This is actually a reactor. All right, let me give you that. Okay, so chemistry, uh, you know, you are all uh, all undergraduate students, right? There are no school students here. So you often have done experiments and sometimes the experiments look like magic. Okay, so second question is based on this. First question was a bit difficult. I know that you have not seen uh, that long tower. But the second question is going to be based on some chemistry we are going to show you. Shruti and uh, Ananya are going to uh, help me with this. Uh, this is a very safe experiment to perform, but to highlight the importance of any chemistry experiment that you do, you need to take care of safety aspects. So you can see that both of them are wearing gloves and both of them have their eyes protected. All right. And so, if I were a uh, magician, I would say nothing is written here, okay? But I'm not, I'm a chemist, so something is written there which you cannot see. And this slightly yellowish or golden colored liquid, uh, I will spray on that piece of paper and see what happens, okay? And what happens should be explained by you, any of you can, but there are two parts of this question. So, whoever gives the correct answer, we'll have to answer the, both the parts. Okay. You can see that I'm spraying it on my hand and I don't really care. All right, lift it up. Okay, so shall I? Okay. Okay. Very simple experiment. Okay. Based on chemistry that you know. So the question is, what are the three chemical components. One is this orange or yellow liquid. It's actually a solution of a salt. And obviously something was written with uh, uh, what, which turned blue and something was written with a different chemical which turned magenta, not magenta. What is this color? Maroon, right? Maroon or blood red or whatever. All right. So uh, thank you, Shruti. Thank you, Ananya. Maybe you can stick it here with this uh, so, any guesses? Yes. Yeah, and what is this? Answer is no. It's not potassium dichromate. Okay, let me give you a hint. Yeah. No. Methanol, ethanol would have evaporated 
you know, we were uh, in the car for 45 minutes. Yeah, that's a, that's a good guess based on what I immediately, what I showed just uh, a few minutes ago. Yeah, so this is ferric chloride. Does it give you a hint? Now you'll get only half the book. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. Uh, is there a displacement reaction happening? Uh, different colored ions. I want very specific to the point answer. I'll tell you the blue color is called Prussian blue. Hint number two. Now, now it is out of the prize uh, winning uh, offer. Okay. All right. Prussian blue is what you get by reacting ferric chloride with potassium ferrocyanide. So, the ones which turn blue were written with potassium ferrocyanide, and the one which turned Maroon, were written with thiocyanate. I thought one of you will win the book, but I'm afraid I'm going to get that, right? <laughs> okay. All right. Question number two. You know, last year was the year of the periodic table, and only four days have passed, so we can still talk a little bit about the periodic table, which I will do. This is, in fact, a real periodic table kept outside the chemistry department of Imperial College in London. Okay. This is actually not a hint. This is only some information. But again, it, and this has real elements. All the stable elements which exist, they are kept in little boxes or bottles or containers. And here's another one, which is kept outside a very famous person's. Uh, there's no, there's no award for answering this, okay? Because some of you would know the answer. I know that for sure. It's not a chemistry question. So a famous person, very rich person, has this particular. Periodic table outside his office. Yeah. So as I said that this is out of our uh, prize winning question. Prize winning questions are only chemistry based questions. Okay. This is a GK. All right. So this is Bill Gates, you know. Uh, so the, that gives you the importance of the periodic table. This is a periodic table of the elements which are used for making a two wheeler or a four wheeler. All right. And you can see that there are various things. I'm not going to go through the details because. Our purpose today is basically to show you experiments. So a variety of these transition elements, non-metals uh, and various heavy metals are used, uh, including of course lithium and uh, cobalt increasingly. I don't see cobalt here, but lithium and cobalt will be increasingly used as you know for um, what? Electric vehicles, all right? And this is something you cannot do without, right? This is this object, and I hope all of you all have your this thing at least in the mute uh, mode and not uh, on. Uh, so uh, the screen contains all these elements, electronics, again some more, I'm sorry, the yellow is not uh, quite visible. Uh, battery has lithium and this is cobalt. And casing has carbon, magnesium, bromine and uh, something else here, I can't read it. Ananya, can you see? Nickel? Nickel, yeah, that's for the stainless steel. Um, I can ask many questions out of it because a lot of you are using mobile phones. So one question is, what is bromine doing in the casing? Okay, uh, I would just like to point out, so while you think about this uh, question, uh, these are the lanthanides, okay, or the so-called? So lanthanides are used not only in the screen but also in the electronics quite a lot. And I would like to point out to you that this is a statement that you will see in many places. Many of the elements which are being used for making mobile phones are running out very, very rapidly. Okay? So you need to be careful about it and don't change the mobile phone every time a new version. Okay? At least when the old one is working. All right. <clears throat> and these are the elements which will run out in 100 years. So this is about lithium uh, cobalt uh, batteries, which are a must in the rechargeable lithium ion batteries. Um, and as you know, last year's Nobel Prize was on this rechargeable lithium cobalt batteries. Lithium price is controlled by the Chinese and cobalt comes largely from the Democratic Republic of, Republic of Congo. And there is always uh, some political turmoil going on. And it turns out that China has purchased a lot of those uh, mines in Democratic Republic of Congo. 
So in other words, the lithium prices and cobalt prices will in the future be controlled by the Chinese. Okay? So they can control the price. And what is happening here is that by 2022, uh, electric cars and petrol cars will have comparable prices. Okay, now they are more expensive. And therefore, the lithium, uh, the cobalt requirement will go up very steadily. But based on the sources of cobalt, largely in uh, Democratic Republic of, Republic of Congo, there's a prediction that, that, that in about 10 years' time, which is not very far away, the, almost 50%, there will be almost 100% shortfall in the supply of cobalt. And that will again push up the price of lithium cobalt batteries and therefore electric cars. So we are going through some sort of a circles unless you know, cheaper batteries, perhaps based on sodium, are uh, developed, uh, there may be a problem. So this is something I thought the young people should be, should be aware of. Uh, before I start showing you some more experiments, let me highlight this particular uh, periodic table. You have seen, you know, variety of periodic tables in various places, but here's a periodic table which, call, which is called isotopesmatter.org, that's the website. It's an IUPAC developed uh, website where, where, where they specifically talk about isotopes and their applications. And I will highlight this. And you see that there are four different background colors here, which I will explain in this slide. The, color, the elements which are white background are elements where there is no stable isotope. So no atomic weight is given. The blue background indicates elements which have only one known isotope. So the isotopic atomic weight is given very accurately up to the, you know, um, up to the, you know, sixth place of decimal in some cases. The ones with the yellow background are elements where there are differences, uh, there are many isotopes present, but the ratios, relative amounts of those isotopes are invariable. They don't change based on the location. So therefore, the average atomic weight is given over here. But the ones which are more interesting have this particular background, this uh, uh, sort of purplish background, light purple background, where there are isotopes, but the relative amounts depend upon the location. As a result, while well, this is the average atomic weight, but there is a range. Depending upon where you get sulfur from, you will have an atomic weight which is 32.059 and 32.076. Now, sulfur is not that common an element. What about something more common, something that we have in water? So here, here is hydrogen. You know, as you know, the hydrogen and deuterium, uh, both are present in the regular water, very small amounts of deuterium. So that causes a small difference in the atomic weight, 1.00784 to 811 depending upon the source of the water, because the deuterium content is different. You may say, who cares? But I'll show you that if you do care about small differences, you will get a lot of useful information. What about oxygen? Oxygen also has 16, 17, and 18. 17 is very rare, a small amount, but 16 and 18, and that causes a difference only in the fourth and fifth place of decimal. But again, that difference is important. And I'll show you with some examples. This is something called, see what happens is when clouds form, okay, and it starts to rain, it turns out that the heavier isotopes, which have either 18O or deuterium, they precipitate first because they're heavier, right? And therefore, areas near the coastal uh, areas, near the coast, or areas with low latitude, they receive more heavier isotope enriched rain than at a higher latitude and higher altitude. And I will show you an example of, uh, of our isotopic map of the United States. I under understand that such a, sim a similar thing is being done in India, but you can see that the blue one indicates less heavy isotope and the deeper colors indicate more amounts of heavy isotope that includes deuterium and O18. And you can see both for uh, uh, hydrogen and deuterium, and, both, and all, this is hydrogen and deuterium, and this is for 16O, 18O, the coastal areas uh, are more enriched in the heavier isotopes, okay? And therefore, if you have grown up here or here, your dental enamel will have the signature of 16O, 18O. 
when I was talking about it uh, to some young colleagues, uh, young, young students, one of my colleagues said that maybe in the future the other card will have your dental enamel composition, okay? So that uh, it will pinpoint to you where you grew up, in fact. Okay, and in fact that becomes interesting because um, these is uh, nail samples taken from people from Norway, you know, high altitude, uh, Ithaca in USA, uh, France, they're all in relatively high latitudes, and this is Belgium, of course Belgium is near, this is near the coastal areas, perhaps, India and Sudan, and you can see that only in India and Sudan you see larger amounts of both 18O and deuterium, and that very clearly gives you an idea that by analyzing things uh, from your body where there is a signature of the water that you have consumed as a child, you can pinpoint some idea, you can get some idea about the location where you grew up. Okay. And I will show it with a more specific uh, real life example. But since I said that, you know, uh, heavier isotope precipitate first, that means the heavier isotopes make the uh, chemicals heavier, right? So, real example is D2O, right? D2O is called heavy water, right? Why is it called heavy water? <coughs> because it is a higher density, right? All right. Um, this is just slightly off, uh, off the main theme. Uh, this is to indicate that, you know, D2O is actually not good for uh, biological systems because uh, if you grow a tobacco plant, for example, in uh, pure H2O and 70% D2O and in between different percentages of D2O, you see the growth got retarded, okay? And this is because of something you may have heard about called kinetic isotope effect, okay? When you replace a light isotope by a heavier isotope, generally the bonds become stronger. I'm, I'm giving you a very sort of layman's view of kinetic isotope effect. The bonds become st stronger harder to break, so the reactions slow down, all right? So this is what happens in biological systems, and if you feed a small mouse with about 20 ml of D2O, the mouse will die. So somebody offering you a glass of heavy water, please don't drink it. Okay, so this is the reason why heavy water is called heavy water, because the density is 1.1, 1 .1, uh, whereas the density of water is pretty close to 1, and you also notice that the freezing point of D2O, which will be relevant for the experiment, is 3.8 degrees, water of course is 0 degrees. So given this information, can you think of an experiment by which I can show to this audience that D2O is heavier than H2O? It's question number three, four, something like this. Yeah. Fill a balloon with D2O and put it in water. Oh, that will require a lot of D2O. I can give you only 3 ml of D2O, you know, it's expensive. You know, bad experiments, I can suggest a bad experiment. I can have a small weighing balance here, weigh out 3 ml of D2O, that will be 3.3 grams, 3 ml of H2O, that will be 3 grams. That's only measuring density. And that, you know, everybody will get bored and start texting, you know, friends that UM is giving a terrible lecture here, measuring something, density at the, at the desk. So I want to show something where even the person last in, uh, in the last row would be able to tell that yes, D2O is heavier than H2O. Any other thoughts? Let me tell you. Ice floats on water. Let me be more precise. H2O ice will float on H2O. D2O ice will also float on D2O. But ice is... 8% lighter than water, so we can assume D2O ice will also be 8% lighter than D2O. But since D2O is 11% heavier than H2O, what does that imply? D2O ice will have a density slightly more than 1. Alright, so here is our experiment then. Is this distilled water or methanol, RO water? Distilled water, okay. We need distilled water, we don't want to have their water density change too much, uh, should be a little less size. Yeah, so I'm going to make some ice cold water here and I'll tell you why that is so. And Shruti and uh, 
Ananya have a foot 3 ml of H2 and 3 ml of D2 in this little cut out syringes uh, and that 12 rupees was used to purchase some food colors. This is the color, the orange color that they use in biryani, fake biryani, which many of you have eaten. Um, and the other uh, eyes is uh, colored with, uh, oh you have used 4 ml here. Okay, this is a um, green color which is often used in making fake palak dishes, particularly when palak is not in season. And these are frozen, okay, and uh, they won't tell me which one is which. All right, I have no idea. You won't tell me, right? They won't tell me which one is which because I can do the experiment and find out which one is H2O, which one is D2O. So one is green, one is orange. So let me put the ice cold water. And the reason for putting ice cold water here is because uh, D2O ice melts at 3.2, 3.8. So therefore, what will happen is that the piece of ice that uh, sinks will melt slowly. So, green ice, orange ice, which one to use first? I'll use green, they say go green, right? And I need to warm it up a little bit, otherwise it will not come out. And we, uh, in fact, freeze it in the poor man's uh, deep freezer, which is? Dry ice is not poor man's. You guys must be rich. You remember the old days? Maybe you don't remember, you have not seen how the... Uh, Kulfi walas would make kulfi on the street. Ice and salt. Okay, so ice and salt, and then uh, can you hold it? So I have this expensive million dollar gadget here, and I will use that for dumping this little piece of green ice and see what happens. Straight away. So that's the duo. But, but there, there may be a question and I will try to address that. You may say that yeah, I have taken the experiment. Okay. Anyway, since that is D2, this size must float, right? Unless they have blown up another 200 rupees worth of D2. I hope you have both are not D2, right? And now you see, no matter how much I persuade this fellow, the orange eyes, it will not go in. Right? So that is D2O, this is H2O. How do I know? You may say that I have added something to the water to make it heavy. Right? I can always do that. I can add some salt to the water and freeze it and that will be have a density higher than H2O. What about the dye? Dye we use in microgram amounts. Okay? Um, so, but, uh, but the way to counter this is because you will observe in your eye, with your eyes, that this will disappear faster than this, indicating this is a higher melting point. And you have, must have studied colligative properties. What does that tell you? That if you dissolve something in water, what happens to the melting point? It gets decreased. But in this case, by doing, by taking ice cold water, you will see this is a higher melting point. Okay, that means that I have not faked the experiment. This is really D2O. And another thing that will happen when this uh, green ice starts to melt is that it will produce liquid D2O, green liquid, and the remaining part of the D2O ice will actually start floating on the green liquid, okay? So that, uh, I think Shruti or Ananya, you alert me in about five minutes time, and you will see that in five minutes, the orange ice will melt, this ice will partly melt, but it will start floating, sort of levitating. Uh, in between the two liquid junctions. So, again, it's a very simple experiment, costs about 200 rupees worth of D2O, but it tells you very easily that uh, D2O is indeed heavier than H2O, rather than measuring the boring density and all that. All right. Okay. So, uh, as I was telling you, that the isotopes are very important in, uh, in understanding many things. And carbon isotopes, for example, in, are used in biology, Earth and planetary science, forensic science, geochronology, and medicine, and so on. And uh, here's an example, real example. This is, you know, uh, some marijuana, ganja, uh, <laughs> in North India, 
which has been seized by the U.S. Department of Justice. Now, what happens in many cases is that when uh, these drug peddlers are arrested with some, let's say, uh, cannabis, they would say that, you know, we, we collected it from the open field. But in reality, they may be growing it in a glass house like this. Okay, which means that it is much more organized than growing in an open field. And in, in such situations, they bring cylinders of carbon dioxide to supplement the carbon dioxide that is present in the atmosphere. But if marijuana is grown in an open field versus in a glass house, they will have a different ratio of carbon-12 and carbon-13. This particular uh, mummy, uh, nicknamed Odzi, where he, uh, he lived in his early days, where he grew up, where he uh, spent most of his time, and from the analyzing the tools, they were also able to find out the type of rocks that he was carrying, which part of that Austrian Alps he came from, or, or from a lower altitude and so on. So by doing this isotopic analysis, you can get a lot of uh, interesting information. For example, the isotopic ratios in the tooth enamel represented the nutrients OG consumed in childhood when the teeth were formed. In the bone, they represented nutrients, nutrients consumed throughout adulthood. And there is a strontium lead ratio that one measures. And his intestinal contents represented his actions during his last days because that's something that he ate before he died for whatever reason. I'll show you an example closer to home. Uh, I will skip this one. This is uh, uh, something that was published in Nature Communications last year uh, about a lake called Rukkund Lake. I don't know if any of you read about it in the newspaper. You did? Okay, so Rukkund Lake is you know, shown here. It's about 5,000 meters in Uttarakhand, roughly located here, close to the Nepal border. And there were lots of bones that were seen in the, around the lake uh, for many years. They were discovered more than 100 years ago. And people thought that these, a, a lot of people who might have <coughs> gathered there on the way to some pilgrimage center might have died because of a catastrophic event, maybe a snowfall or a blizzard or something. But by doing isotopic analysis and also DNA analysis, they found that the bones represented, in fact, two time zones, okay. separated almost by a thousand years, and also three ethnic groups, including one ethnic group from the Mediterranean areas. Okay, so the details are not clear. It was just the initial study, but gives you some idea about, you know, what both DNA analysis, of course, and uh, isotopic analysis can, can tell you about uh, the events that have happened in the past and you're trying to put together the pieces of bits and pieces of the puzzle to build up a story. Perhaps more will come out of this in the coming uh, years. All right. Now, here is something to close up to. Now, now, now a little bit of a chemistry close to our daily lives, okay? Not Austrian Alps, not uh, anywhere else. This is a sandwich that uh, I ate in one of these flights, you know. Uh, you don't get much food these days. So you get one of these sandwiches. And uh, this is called a marble bread. How many of you read the expiry date of, uh, you know, products that you buy? All of you do. Do you read the labels? Beyond the expiry date, the contents? You do. Now, do, what do you think the brown stuff is? Some people think it's made from both uh, flour and also atta, okay, whole wheat flour, and that's the color and that makes it more healthy. Some people think it's more healthy because it has got some wheat flour. Okay, is it true? You don't know. So for that, you have to read the label. All right, this was 7th December. If you read the label and the contents, you find out that for the refined flour, water, sugar, caramel color, it's nothing but caramel color. There's no wheat flour in it. So it's not as nutritious as you thought it would be. Okay, so what I'm trying to tell you is that, you know, it's very important to um, read the label sometimes because you can learn a lot of new chemistry. And some of these numbers which might... Uh, do any of you know what these numbers represent? These are various food and food additives which are legally... Uh, can be legally used in, in uh, processed food. And you can simply search for this name, number, either with INS number or with the E number, European number, and we'll find out what the chemicals are and uh, approved chemicals and what they can, what they're doing in the food. 
Uh, incidentally, it will also have a nutritional information indicating protein, carbohydrate, sugar, and so on. But sometimes these numbers that you see are also not accurate. And to highlight that, I would like to point out that a, uh, another label. Okay, this label came from a small piece of cookie I had in, in, in an Air India flight. Okay, it says carbohydrates, out of 100 grams, carbohydrates is this much, protein, cholesterol, total fat, etc., etc. Now, it turns out if you add these numbers, it's more than 100. And secondly, 100 gram of a cookie cannot have 7 grams of cholesterol. Then I would rather use, extract the cholesterol from these Air India biscuits and sell it. It will be very cheap. Okay. So, obviously, these numbers are wrong. So, sometimes, you know, you also need to look at these numbers uh, with more than a pinch of salt. Okay. All right. So, it's important that you uh, pay some attention to that and it's important that I pay attention to this. Orange ice is almost gone. It's almost like a small uh, rice grain and you can see that the D2 ice is happily dancing above the uh, liquid D2O. Maybe you can, one of you can uh, take it around and show it. Okay. Um, all right. I need one of you here. Because uh, I'm going to do what is called a elephant toothpaste experiment, which some of you have seen. Okay, and this, in fact, is not a you know, if I'm showing it to high school kids or younger kids, I'll say elephant toothpaste. But to you, I'll say it's an experiment in catalysis. Uh, hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide is a thermodynamically unstable but kinetically stable molecule. Okay, it's thermodynamically unstable because it has got a weak OO bond. Any weak bond is generally energy rich and it will try to break. And it does break into water and oxygen, but it doesn't happen on its own. It does happen if you heat it and it will happen when it is subject to some catalysis. And all of you have studied catalysis, I suppose, right? Right from the school days when you study that for making oxygen out of potassium chlorate, you have to use... You have to use... What is used as a catalyst? You might have studied in, in, in ninth standard, manganese dioxide. To decompose potassium chlorate, KClO3, you need MnO2 as a catalyst. Am I speaking too fast? Okay, maybe I'll slow down a little bit. It turns out that sodium iodide acts as a catalyst for this reaction, but sodium bicarbonate is not which means that it is the iodide which acts as the catalyst. So, what we will do to make this reaction interesting is that... Is that hydrogen peroxide? Good. To make it more interesting, I will add some liquid soap, mix some liquid soap and it can be undiluted liquid soap of any kind. You don't care too much about the brand. Okay. And then I'm going to mix this with, thank you, with a generous amount of 30% hydrogen peroxide. I have to pour it carefully because it's pretty corrosive otherwise. Uh, I must wipe this because hydrogen peroxide otherwise will start burning my finger. Okay, give it a good stir. And put it in, uh, can all of you see this? Uh, put it in this, uh, do we have a measuring cylinder without a spout? Without this uh, stopper? Yeah, that's better. Or maybe, oh, wait a second. Okay, I think this is better because it has a narrow neck. It will come out faster. All right. So the purpose of adding the liquid soap is basically to make a foam out of uh, the evolving oxygen. Okay. But whenever you do a, do a uh, reaction, you must always do what is called a control reaction. Because if I add sodium iodide and oxygen comes out, it doesn't tell me that sodium is the catalyst or iodide is the catalyst. So to prove, to prove or disprove, I'll add some sodium bicarbonate, which also has sodium, and see what happens. Nothing happens, right? So sodium is not a catalyst, bicarbonate is not a catalyst. So, uh, to make things happen a little bit faster, I'm going to add 
the sodium iodide. You know, this I, I, I probably almost sound like one of those uh, cookbook uh, cooking shows, right? So I'm going to add a little bit of salt and pepper. Now, sodium iodide in the water. And are we are we ready? Let's see what happens. Here comes the oxygen foam. It's brownish in color because some of the iodide got oxidized by, uh, by hydrogen peroxide. Okay, and you see a lot of foam comes out. And if we are allowed to use fire, uh, which we shouldn't, uh, I don't see any fire extinguishers. Okay, so uh, if I light a matchstick, it will glow much, much uh, better. Okay, and if I have a piece of wood which is burning but not glowing, and if I put that, it will burst into flames. And I often do this experiment, it's very safe because you get only water vapor, what is coming out is steam and we generate oxygen, which is probably good because we have a lot of people here uh, exhaling carbon dioxide. So I'm adding a little bit to the health of this healthy, uh, you know, air quality of the room. All right. So that is about the toothpaste experiment. And, uh, you know, it, it's been four years, but uh, 2016 was 100 years of our understanding of chemical bonding. So I'll spend a few minutes talking about chemical bonding in a very uh, simple manner, no quantum mechanics, okay? <laughs> All right, using only things which uh, kids would understand. But the purpose of showing some of the simple examples is that you can also take it forward and, you know, if you have to teach somebody at a, at a, of a, of a younger age, you can use some examples of this kind. So one of the things I would like to highlight is that, you know, when there are uh, two orbitals which have dissimilar sizes, okay, the bond is usually weak. So to illustrate that, I use a small hand and a big hand. The handshake is not a firm handshake. And for example, nitrogen, small atom, iodine, big atom, if you make a bond, the bond is typically weak. It's about 38 kilocalories per mole. And just to compare this number, 38 kilo or 40 kilocalories per mole, two spoons of sugar will have 40 calories, right? Two spoons of sugar is about 10 grams. And as you know, you have studied, but forgotten, that carbohydrates give you four grams, uh, four kilocalories per gram, right? Fat, nine kilocalories, and protein, protein is also four. Protein and carbohydrate give four kilocalories each, fat gives you nine. Okay, so anyway, so here's the other one, <coughs> orbitals of same sizes. I had pictures of orbitals here, but I, I'm not sure where they disappeared. Hmm. It's not there on my screen either. So firm handshakes, strong bonds, and uh, very, very strong bond like between carbon, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, and so on. Now, if one Ni bond is weak, if I make Ni3, satisfying all the valences of nitrogen, it will be a very energy-rich compound, right? So let's make an I3. Well, <coughs> assume it's already made. And I'm not going to do the experiment here. It will be very messy. Um, but Ni3 has a very unique uh, property. It's extremely shock sensitive, all right? And uh, let, let's do the experiment and see how shock sensitive it is. It's on video. And there will be an associated question. So. Listen the first few lines very carefully and one of the organizers should identify if somebody gets the correct answer because he or she will get a copy of this book. Okay, now watch and listen. When nitrogen triiodide, the dark colored solid, is dry, it is very sensitive to touch or any vibration. Simply touching it with the feather causes it to explode or detonate. One detonation causes another to occur. One product of the reaction is violet iodide vapor. When nitrogen triiodide, the dark colors... So you have seen how shock sensitive it is, right? So the quest, my question is, if it is so shock sensitive, how do you keep it on the filter paper? Yeah, so you get this book. What's your name? Okay, so please don't forget to collect this book. All right, so I, I stopped just before that statement. Let me play it again. 
colored solid is dry, it is very sensitive to touch or any other. So when it is dry, it is very sensitive to shock. And you may remember uh, not too long ago when you had uh, when we had the Diwali festival, Diwali, and uh, or any other excuse also, you burst crackers, right? But if the fireworks are wet, they will not ignite because water has a very high specific heat. It takes away the heat. So it is made, Ni3 is made in aqueous solution and so you keep it on the filter paper when it is still wet and it's easy to handle and then you run away, okay? Because I often joke that if you have a bad cold and sneeze how very hard near uh, dry Ni3, it may explode. I'm yet to try that experiment though. Now, that's about a weak covalent bond. What about weak non-covalent bond uh, between, uh, let's say, uh, an oxygen and nitrogen? Okay, or the so-called hydrogen bond. They're weak, but they're very important in biology, right? They maintain the alpha helix structure, they maintain the double helix structure of DNA. But collectively, they can make a big difference. Okay, one uh, hydrogen bond may be weak, but when we have many of them, it can make a difference in maintaining the alpha helix or the DNA double helix. Uh, in water structure, for example, I mentioned about, you know, H2O ice having an 8% lower uh, density. And that is because when water freezes, it opens up, forms a diamondoid structure, okay, with a lot of empty space. If it works out on the lower left side, you will see a, uh, a, an animation which illustrates how uh, liquid water becomes, this is liquid water, it's freezing and it will open up, okay. As a result, it loses many hydrogen bonds. And that gets uh, reflected in the increased uh, volume or the lower density. And I'm sure that many of you have done this experiment uh, at home when you uh, take a bottle of water and keep it in the deep freezer. You all know what happens, right? The water expands, the uh, bottle gets deformed. If it's a plastic bottle, if it's a glass bottle, it can break. Now in this experiment, which is not very safe to do here, so I'll not do it. Uh, we will have an iron uh, can canister uh, looking like a bomb, um, fill it with water and freeze it rather quickly uh, by dipping it in dry ice, somebody said dry ice, dry ice acetone at minus 78. Let's the see what happens. The bomb illustrates the fact that the volume of ice is greater than the volume of an equal mass of liquid water. Some cold water is poured into a cast iron bomb and a threaded plug is screwed into the bomb so that the bomb is tightly sealed. The bomb is then placed into a dry ice acetone slush, which is at negative 77 degrees Celsius, and will cause the water inside the bomb to freeze. A wooden box is placed over the top of the bomb and slush bath. It takes a short time for the water to freeze. When it does, the bomb explodes. Some of the dry ice acetone slush is blown onto the explosion shield. Little bits of the cast iron bomb are left. When the water freezes, the pressure is enough to cause this cast iron bomb with more than one eighth inch thick sides to burst. So uh, this simple experiment gives you a very clear impression of what loss of many hydrogen bonds at the same time rather rapidly can do uh, to this. Um, what about breaking strong bonds? Okay, I'll show you how uh, carbon dioxide CO bond can be broken. Okay, because this also illustrates uh, why, uh, I mean, these days you are reading about global warming. So it will be useful to do some experiment with carbon dioxide, but again, it is too dangerous to do in an auditorium. So I'll show you uh, on this video again. Are you able to hear the audio part of the video? Okay, it's not too bad. The quality is not, not so good. So this is a block of dry ice and some magnesium will be kept here and ignited and covered with another block of dry ice. And you see what happens. Magnesium is placed in a cavity in a block of dry ice. The magnesium is ignited. Metal fires are difficult to start and <coughs> difficult to extinguish. And covered with another block of dry ice. So you covered with another block of dry ice, so the burning magnesium sees only dry ice and nothing else around it. 
But you notice what happens. Despite the absence of air, the magnesium continues to glow due to its reaction with carbon dioxide. Because of this reaction, carbon dioxide cannot be used to extinguish magnesium fires. Okay, so let, let's open it up and uh, see what's inside. The reaction products are white magnesium oxide and black carbon. Okay, so magnesium essentially has extracted oxygen out of carbon dioxide. You might say, aha, that's a way to solve the global warming problem because we can bring out all the carbon dioxide and react with magnesium and get carbon back. That doesn't work economically. You know why? Because magnesium metal does not occur free in nature. Okay, it comes in the form of ores like dolomite and magnesite, which is magnesium 2 plus, and it's very hard to reduce magnesium 2 plus back to carbon because you have to put in that much of energy that you saw coming out of it when you burn it. So, no carbon dioxide extinguisher when you have metal fires. Okay, so that's the lesson. What about uh, stronger bonds like nitrogen, nitrogen triple bond? Can you break them? How do you break them? Okay, any other way? Okay, any other way? Okay, this is a hint to a question that I've asked earlier. All right, so now, this is uh, some organic chemistry because, you know, officially I uh, work in the organic chemistry department. So my colleagues will become very upset if I don't show any organic chemistry experiment. And something that you have all studied in your high school, right? About Reaction mechanism, about SN1 reaction, SN2 reaction. Now, I show you the three isomers of a 4-carbon bromide. Primary bromide, secondary bromide, tertiary bromide. Now, if I ask you a question, there's no price for this, okay? That which one will react fastest in SN2 reaction? Primary, SN2 reaction. What about SN1 reaction, which one reacts fastest? Tertiary. All right. Have you seen this reaction being done? No. I'm surprised. No, this is a very simple reaction to do. And uh, it should be done in high school. Okay, it doesn't cost much money. But how do you show it to a large audience that this reaction, this is the fastest reacting, this is next, and this is next. Which reaction would you do? You know, SN2 reaction is also called solvolysis. That is, you try to break this bond and replace it with the solvent molecule in layman's term. Now, in, in this reaction, if, if ROH is my solvent, then one of the products of this will be hydrogen bromide. So anything that can detect acid or bromide can be used for monitoring the reaction or the rate of the reaction, right? So how do you monitor bromide? How do you test for bromide? You have done it in your first BSc. Orange globule test, that's where you make bromine. No, no, no. I'm not going to make bromine in this room. Silver nitrate. Silver forms a precipitate with bromide. So, but there's a problem because the halides are not soluble in water. So what we are going to do is to have uh, silver nitrate and methanol. And uh, yes. And therefore, if there is any reaction, I'll come back to that later. So that will be for the last two. Okay, so I'm going to pour about 50 ml of, yes, good, we need the light now, of silver nitrate and methanol in each of these three measuring cylinders. One, two, and three. And I'm going to add the primary secondary and the tertiary bromides in that order, primary, secondary, tertiary. To make it easy to visualize, I will put a black background here, okay? Now here is a uh, primary halide. So the observation would be, if the reaction happens, I generate HBr and I have silver ion, so I'll get a precipitate of silver bromide. So if there is a precipitate reaction is happening, if there is no precipitate, there's no reaction. Okay, so let's start with the primary. Okay, 
this in this order it's okay to use the same property any precipitation nothing secondary nothing is tertiary tertiary this should react something should happen right otherwise if all the three nothing happens then it's a bad failed experiment and a bad experiment something happened right you get a precipitate what does it imply that no it, it simply implies you know from this observation you only say that bromide has been generated and how would bromide be generated if the, react, the reaction proceeds in the forward direction and therefore you will have precipitate of silver bromide now secondary one it's like fog near bangalore airport some flights are not able to land okay now secondary does react but much slower okay but this also serves as a clock for my lecture i still have 30 minutes right in 30 minutes you will see that this will become almost like that so this serves as a nice little 30 minute clock for me primary no sign of reaction but it may become a little bit cloudy at the end okay so that's one part of the experiment which is very straightforward to do now i will need i need to borrow a little more space from here now if i ask you a second related question again to those who have studied organic chemistry that if i have tertiary butyl now now i have only tertiary butyl derivative bromide and chloride which one will react faster bromide why bromide is a better leaving group you all know that but how do i test that how do i prove that yeah but then from a distance you will not be able to distinguish the color and you know one is chloride is white bromide is pale yellow okay but then there is another option i can also test with hydrogen or a proton so let's do this fun thing by trying both ways okay bromide chloride bromide chloride one in silver nitrate one in an indicator and i would like to show you and you watch the experiment carefully i would like to show you that there will be a difference and i want you to answer why there is a difference so sometimes when you have two possibilities of doing an experiment or multiple possibilities not all of them will give you the correct answer and here i will i would like to point out to you that one of them will not give you the correct answer because i want to add the reagents at the same time and for the second one i will use only methanol no silver ion and uh, to detect the ph to detect the ph i will use what is called a universal indicator okay this is also locally available i need some more colors okay this deep yellow indicator will make the methanol deep yellow but in the presence of an acid it will turn pink okay and to make it easy to visualize i have to put the white background here okay there yeah, one more proper okay so this is chloride uh, i need the chloride first is fresh chloride but here i don't want any contamination so i'll add the chloride here bromide here chloride here bromide here this is with silver ion this is with indicate indicator okay so here goes chloride here goes bromide which you have already seen any difference bromide reacting faster fresh chloride right now this is one should turn pink faster than the other chloride bromide anything happening so far nothing happened okay let me uh, give it a stir let me give it a stir here Do we see any changes? Do 
we see any changes? Did we see any change difference here in between the two? But you notice that this is turning pink, which means it is liberating acid, right? Now, this happened very rapidly with silver ions. Even the chloride also started reacting, that solution has become cloudy. But here, this was slow, so is this one. Now, I'm measuring the same reaction. But one seems to be producing H plus at a slower rate. In the other reaction, bromide is produced at a faster rate. How can that be possible? It's the same reaction. I'm monitoring by two different means. But this seems to be faster than this. So which one is right? It turns out that silver is what is called a hydrophilic metal. So silver, in the presence of silver, this bromide, silver coordinates to the bromide or the chloride and pulls it out. So it facilitates breaking of the carbon halogen bond. Okay, so therefore the reaction that we are observing in the presence of silver ion is actually a silver assisted reaction. So silver is acting sort of like a catalyst, not exactly, but it induces a faster reaction. Whereas here, it is the kind of native reaction rate. So if I really want to measure the rates, relative reaction rates, I should do it that way. And now you see this has become pink. This will also become pink when I finish my talk in another 25 minutes. Okay? All right. So this is, a, again, a very simple experiment that you can do almost with household chemicals. You know, chemicals that can be purchased rather easily. These are also easy to purchase. They're inexpensive or easy to prepare. Okay, so how are we doing with time? Okay, so I would like to show you an example of, uh, you know, we have seen uh, color change with uh, <coughs> solvent polarity, right? These things, um, uh, Ananya and uh, Shruti, we can probably keep these things here, but slightly make some more space available on the right hand side. Okay, because let, let this be here. Also, also move these things a little bit closer so that I have a bit of space here. That should be more than enough. And you can set three measuring cylinders here. So I need to have a, a sip of water before I can go further. Yeah, I don't want to drink the distilled water. Okay, let me uh, make some ice water. Oops. You see some changes here? Hmm? So this is what is called, oh, solvent chromosome we have already done, right? So this is this is what it is. So this is a magic glass that came uh, from uh, Wiley VCHA publishing house in 2011. As you can see, that was IYC, International Year of Chemistry. Why? Because a very famous woman chemist got Nobel Prize in 1911. Who was she? Eric Curie, all of you know. Okay, so this is solvatochromism because what happens here is, sorry, it's called thermochromism, okay? Because of the ice water, it changed color. No change in the water. Water remains colorless. And you will notice that when I put this 37 degree fingers, Okay, the color changes back to clear plastic. So there are many materials which change color with temperature. And this one, I don't know what it is. It's an organic molecule, but I have been using this glass for the last almost nine years. And uh, it's very stable because it is embedded in the plastic. It's probably some, um, some pro proprietary material. Okay. Um, but there are this kind of material. So this one changes color between five and 10 degrees. So, if you really want a cold uh, beverage, then this is the right glass for this. So, but then I would not like to drink it from there. So, let's drink something else. Okay. I think most of you are not 21 yet, right? So, let's get rid of that. Okay. We, we would like to have all the lights on. 
okay, the next few experiments will only be on color. All right. Now, do any of you know what is meant by tonic water or Indian tonic water? Have you come across this uh, can uh, like this? It's used in, in this uh, famous uh, British drink called gin and tonic. Now, just to avoid anything, I have even washed these things, you know, with, with water. So you don't have any alcohol inside. All right. So what it turns out that this tonic water uh, dates back to 700 years. When the British came to India and to, uh, I think I'm going to create a mess here, no, let me be there. When the British came to India and Southeast Asia, they were all uh, welcome with uh, malaria, right? And uh, many other things. Uh, but what happened is, uh, they started taking quinine, which was the only drug available those days. Right, and quinine is very bitter. So quinine with water, even diluted with water, was very, very bitter. So then this thought that, well, why don't we add some alcohol? And gin was already an alcoholic drink in, uh, in UK. So gin and tonic became a very famous drink since those days. Now, um, tonic water still contains a little bit of quinine and slightly bitter for those. And this has no alcohol. Okay? So I'm doing only safe experiments here. Okay, so I'm going to put some tonic water here. which has quinine and I will also put some soda water here which looks, which will look very similar. Tonic water is also carbonated, okay? And this doesn't have quinine. I'll add a little bit more so that they all, they both look identical. Lights off please, all lights off, complete darkness. And I'm going to do this thing, rotate this one, this light also off. Uh, and I will also switch out this light. Ooh, too dark. <laughs> okay, now I have I have rotated this thing this way, that way. So I don't know which one is tonic water, which one is uh, uh, soda water, right? Now, how to distinguish? Well, quinine is a fluorescent molecule. You have heard about or you have seen fluorescent molecules, right? So I have this. UV torch here, UV uh, fluorescent lamp here. Okay, that's that has got this yellow uh, blue light plus UV light. So if I put this thing in the tonic water, it will show a beautiful blue fluorescence. So this is plain water or the soda water. Okay, you see only reflection of the blue light. But here, this is beautiful tonic water. Okay, and this shows that tonic water contains quinine. Okay, now let the tonic water be here because I'm going to do one more experiment with the tonic water. We can have some lights on but not all. Okay, so this is the structure of quinine. Okay, all right. Now what does this image tell you? What physical principle is associated with this scattering, of light. scattering, right? So scattering of light is what gives the sky blue color and the setting sun the orange or red color. So in other words, when light passes through a medium, this is actually going to be a physics experiment. Okay, it can be transmitted, right? If it, it can be transmitted, it can be scattered and it can be absorbed. And when it gets absorbed, again, many things can happen. There can be chemical reaction, like photochemical reaction, or there can be fluorescence, like what you just saw. So we are going to do a fun experiment, and that will be by my last but one experiment. I think we are doing okay with time. So uh, we will put water in each of these measuring cylinders. Okay, it doesn't matter how much. This will be the last one. Be, this will be the last one.
Okay, and I have two monochromatic sources of radiation. One is this green laser, which is 532 nanometer, and this is the red laser, which is which is That's you don't know. This is probably 617, 650 nanometer. Okay, so 532 and 650. Now this is no lights, please. Thank you. Uh, I'll have the background light on for a little while. I pass green light through this water. Oh, this water is not very clean. It's showing a little bit of scattering. Okay. And I pass again red light through it. Again, you see the light beam. You are not supposed to see the light beam if there is no scattering. Right? So this water is not, or, or the maybe the measuring cylinder was had some dust particles. But I'm going to make it look a little bit uh, more uh, scattering uh, by adding a few grains of this milk powder. Okay, just a little so that uh, it gives a colloidal suspension like this. And now I should be able to observe um, scattering more effectively. You see that? Okay, there are some big particles floating around, but if I draw, add a few drops of tea or coffee, it will look even better. Okay, but the important thing is that it's only scattering because the red light remains red and uh, green line remains green. Again, you see a beautiful scattering. All right, all of you can see this? All right. <clears throat> so we see transmission, we see scattering. And now I'm going to use this... Uh, rather cheap uh, 20 rupee pink highlighter okay this contains a, a dye called solvent red 49 okay and this is a in chemically it's called a rhodamine dye and it has a unique property and I would like to highlight that property and again you see that there's no um, not much of activity here but I'm going to add a bit of ink from this ballpoint pen, uh, not ballpoint pen, it's the highlighter, right? This is a solvent red 49 and if I hold it against the beam, you will see that it has got a slight pink color, right? So that's because of the rhodamine dye. But in addition to that pink color, it also has, you know, because when you apply it on a highlight, if you want to highlight something, you have to have the ink spread and therefore, um, Therefore, you need to have uh, some other fillers. So as a result, when I pass red light through it, it will not be absorbed, but it will show a scattering. Again, it, it shows the scattering, okay? I'll add a little bit more perhaps. And mix it up. And you see more scattering. Right? But with green light, you will see something unusual because rhodamine absorbs green light and emits yellow. So the green light will now turn yellow. And here we go. Okay. Whereas in this case, you saw green remaining green, but by changing the dye, I make it yellow. Okay. So this is an example of light absorption and emission at a longer wavelength and that is nothing but fluorescence. Okay, so this is what we did. But now that makes, it, make, makes me a little bit greedy because I showed you that this fellow, no lights please, until I ask, because we are now going to create light. Now this is what, what is this? Tonic. Quinine, right? Quinine. Quinine gives green, uh, blue fluorescence, that dye gives yellow. Now, yellow and blue are complementary colors. If I mix them in right proportion, I should get white light. Okay, let's see if it works out. I need to pour out this liquid. Okay, so I have this uh, tonic water. I'll reduce the concentration by diluting it. And uh, you can see it is still, uh, it is, uh, I keep losing the switch. It is still showing a blue fluorescence. 
And what I'm going to do now is to stir some of this ink from, um, this is better actually, the cheaper one is better. Okay, so now if I shine uh, the laser, I'll see yellow. Okay, because the laser has a longer wavelength, it will not excite we need. But if I use a short wave excite, excitation, I should see a whitish color. Do you see that? Do you see that what was uh, blue now has become white? It is because I am exciting both quinine and the dye. Quinine is giving blue fluorescence. Quinine and the rhodamine dye is giving yellow. And these two complementary colors are now mixed and forming a white light emitting system. Even though the color of the solution is orange. Okay. All right. So this time it worked nice. Okay. So thank you, uh, Shruti and uh, Ananya. We are nearing uh, 10 minutes uh, deadline. Can I continue for 10? Maybe 15. I may borrow a few minutes if uh, that doesn't uh, cause lunch time problems. <coughs> so the last experiment, we don't need any light at all because we are going to generate light. Now in the experiment that I showed uh, on uh, the fluorescence, what do we do? We take light and convert to the light of a longer wavelength, right? But in the last experiment, we would like to take a weak chemical bond and convert it directly into light. Now, you can convert chemical energy into light energy through heat, right? For example, in the old uh, tungsten lamps, which are now getting phased out, you take a tungsten filament, pass electricity, which ultimately comes from burning of coal, so, chemical energy to electrical energy to heat to light. But, in chemiluminescence, what you see in a, in a firefly also, that is called bioluminescence, uh, you basically convert chemical energy into light. And that will be our last experiment for today. And what we would like to do is to use hydrogen peroxide again as our fuel, because it has got a weak OO bond and mix it with another chemical, slightly nasty chemical called oxalyl chloride. And that will generate this molecule, which looks like two carbon dioxide molecules forcibly put together, right? Now this fellow, as you might expect, is not very stable. And it will break into two carbon dioxide molecules. And I've colored them differently because one of them is the so-called ground state carbon dioxide. The other one is electronically excited state. It's a molecularly excited state. If I don't do anything, it will simply lose the excess energy as, as heat, and that's very boring. But to make things interesting, we would add fluorescent molecules so that they will trap the energy from the excited carbon dioxide and themselves will get electronically excited. And now, because they are fluorescent molecules, when they come back to the ground state, you must be hearing about electronic excitation and so on. Um, <clears throat> uh, so that will lose a photon and depending upon the choice of these molecules, I can get photons of different colors. Coming back to my student, photon, okay, whom I showed in the beginning. Okay, now a couple of structures are missing here, I'm not sure why. Uh, here's the structure of a uh, anthracene with the two phenyl groups. It is another more complex molecule called rubrine. This is called perylene and this is tetracene. Tetracene looks like two naphthalines put together. Uh, regardless of this uh, you know, absence of these molecules, this fellow will show you a, a blue-violet light, rubrine will show you an orange light, perylene uh, sky blue light, whereas tetracene will show a green light emission. So give me uh, about a minute or two. So 910 diphenylanthracene, I will put in the first one. These are chemicals which are supplied by Sigma Aldrich, so I again uh, am grateful to them because these are pretty expensive stuff, particularly the last one I'm going to put. This is rubrine, um, which is an orange solid. Uh, again, you have to take my word for it. Okay. The third one is perylene, which is relatively inexpensive. It is 
derivatives of pyridine are used in car paints, particularly the bright yellow, uh, red colors that you see in various cars. And uh, finally, the sort of two naphthalenes put together, tetracine, which is the most expensive chemical, uh, uh, costs about uh, 10,000 rupees per 100 milligrams. So here goes about 500 rupees worth of tetracine. Okay, so the difficult part is over. Um, thank you, Ananya. And I am going to dissolve these things in a little bit of dichloromethane, which is CH2Cl2, just to dissolve these dyes. So again, uh, from your left, I have diphenylanthrazine, which will give you a blue-violet color. Next one is beryline, which will give a an orange color. And this one is, uh, sorry, this is rope green will give you an orange color. Beryline will give you a cyan color. And finally, diphenyl uh, tetracine will give you a green color. I will do these two a little bit later. Uh, but let me show you that perylene, if I excite with the blue light, uh, excuse me, green light, it will still show the yellow, right? This is root green, okay? But instead of light, I will now generate the energy from chemical bonds. Yeah, so I will add oxalyl chloride first to this and to this. Okay, there's a color change, which is fine. And now, I don't need any light at all. As promised, there's a blue-violet color here and an orange color here. And again, again, these two are complementary colors. Okay, so let's mix a little bit of this orange into the blue and see whether we get white. white again turning into blue because the orange color will not survive for too long. It's orange, white and blue. Is it magic? It's all chemistry. And the light is so intense I can figure out that this is Shruti and this is Ananya. All right. Okay. So the last experiment is with, the, uh, with these two materials. Um, tetracine and, excuse me, perylene and tetracine in, the, in that order. So cyan and uh, I, I should do it quickly before this color fades out. And this, uh, again as promised you see cyan on your left and green on your right. Okay, now this color will survive for a long time but the orange and the green will disappear because these two sensitizers or the fluorescent molecules are somewhat unstable. So we have all the four different colors. You can make more colors by adding, by choosing a suitable sensitizer to this. Okay. And to understand why, for example, the different molecules give different colors, you have to understand their photophysical properties and uh, many other items of photochemistry, why some of them survive for less time than others. Okay, with this I come to the end of my talk. Question. Any answers to this? We can have the lights on now, unless you want to watch this for a longer time. So, any, any thoughts about this? I told you, how do you break a nitrogen-nitrogen triple bond? You said lightning. There's no lightning here. You have all studied Haber's process in your high school. So none of you will get the second book. So this is a reactor, ammonia reactor. You know N2 plus 2H2 giving 2NH3. The most important reaction in agriculture, right? Because even now the Fertilizer Corporation of India has many plants making ammonia, ammonium nitrate, some of it is getting diverted for making explosives, but that's not our problem. Um, and for making ammonium phosphate and, and also urea. So this particular uh, reactor 
made close to a million tons of ammonia over 55 years, and it is kept outside the BASF factory in, in Germany in a place called Ludwig Schaffen. You now see, I mentioned that this will turn pink towards the end of my talk, and this will become cloudy, more cloudy towards the end of my talk. This is the secondary halide, the primary. It has also reacted a little bit. Okay, <clears throat> so that was the question. All right, <clears throat> anybody knows, can guess who this person is? Not the, not, not the faculty or the teachers. This is the only person who got two unshared Nobel Prizes. One in peace, one in chemistry. You must know the name, Linus Pauli. Okay, I have a video on his life, but I won't play it now because it is already late uh, for lunch. Uh, so I'll uh, keep it for some other time. But one of the things that comes out of this video is that how he discovered the alpha helix. I showed you the structure of alpha helix. He discovered it in a hospital bed in Oxford when he had no tools and he tried for 11 years to solve the alpha helix, to, to solve the protein structure problem, but he was not successful. But he took a sheet of paper and started folding it after drawing the one dimensional structure of a peptide and then eventually he came out with the answer. So the bottom line is that even if you are unsuccessful today, you can be unsuccessful, you can, you can see success tomorrow or 11 years later. So don't give up if you have a good problem, okay, in your mind. And the other point I would like to tell you is that uh, uh, Pauling also discovered this thing in a hospital bed, okay. So, um, so even if you are sick, you can still make discoveries. But don't work on the alpha helix problem again, it's already done. And always keep your eyes open, okay. And a different version of it was said by a very famous person, the chance favors the prepared mind, right, that you must have read. So many things can happen in front of your eyes, and if you see something unusual, try to probe it, try to find out why, why it happened, what, it, what happened, and so on. For example, the 7 grams of cholesterol uh, in 100 gram of uh, biscuit, all right, of course that's not real. Okay, and I said keep your eyes open, right? And I'll end with one last example. Why it is important to keep your eyes open? Let me ask you a very stupid question. Well, what appears to be a stupid question. You all have been making solutions in your, uh, in your practicals, right? So suppose I give you chemically pure sodium and potassium hydroxides. Okay, how, do you, how many grams of sodium and potassium hydroxide would be needed for making, let's say, one liter of about one normal sodium hydroxide, one normal KOH solution. And I'll tell you, KOH has an atom molecular weight of 56, sodium hydroxide has an atomic weight of, a molecular weight of 40. Say, 40 sodium hydroxide and KOH, 56. If it were that simple, then I would appear very stupid. I wouldn't ask this question, right? It turns out, that chemically pure sodium hydroxide can be 99.5% pure. But even the most pure, chemically pure potassium hydroxide still contains 15% of water. For example, here is a bottle of KOH and it says about 85-84%. That's why I'm saying keep your eyes open. When you <coughs> use a chemical bottle, you must read the label, okay? To make sure it is what it is and for example, is it chemically pure? Does it have water? Does it have other impurities? Because that can make a difference in the concentration. So the correct answer would be 56 divided by about 0.85, approximately. Okay, so that's more or less the end. And since I'm already in the red by two minutes, two and a half minutes, uh, I would like to end now. But you know, since last year was the periodic table year, year of the periodic table, I must play the periodic table song. Many of you have listened to it before, but, the, but for those who have not, I will play the song. Let me see if I can play the original song by uh, Tom Lehara, because this was created by a physics uh, mathematics professor in Harvard University called Tom Lehara. Now, I have been playing his song with some animations, but I'll try to play a song recorded in Copenhagen in 1967, and he sang it himself, okay? So that's really the, uh, that, that's the real thing.
that will take just about a minute or so. Are we ready? chemical experiments and uh, understand principle behind things that you have already read. So, uh, to, uh, so uh, if you think about additional experiments, please do let me know uh, how uh, one, can, uh, one can take these things forward and how you can plan to illustrate other experiments that uh, can throw light. So, I am always uh, willing to uh, learn from you. Uh, if you have some, some good ideas about doing some experiments, either differently or new experiments. Okay, because I keep changing the experiments because otherwise people who are sitting in the front row will say that, you know, I'm repeating the same things again and again. So with this, I would like to thank uh, Shruti and Ananya for <laughs> coming here, for doing all these experiments with me and also uh, uh, cleaning up the mess that was created here. There is some more mess here. Uh, but be careful because that has got some unreacted hydrogen peroxide. So thank you both very much. Um, I would also like to thank Professor Sudi and Professor Mukunda and all the resonance creators who uh, uh, who really put together this very nice, uh, interesting program. And finally, thank you all for your patience.